goddess has always been associated with art, with creation. Since the beginnings of art over 40,000 years ago, she is and has been a living presence in the artist's imagination. My name is Star Goody, and today our show is going to be the triple goddess in art. We're going to be focusing on the triple goddess by looking at images of her as she's depicted in art throughout all of history, and we're going to be seeing her in each of her three faces. My guest for this program is writer, ritualist Joan Sutherland, who is the founder of the Amargi Center, which is dedicated to the practice of women's spirituality. Welcome, Joan. Thank you, Star. <laughs> um, I think that the triple goddess is best known to us in her aspect as the muse, as historically she's known as the source of inspiration, the source of the artist's creative power, which is inspiration. Now, we know that poets evoke the muse at the beginning of their poetry as an inspiration because she does inspire and breathe life into the artist's imagination. The triple goddess tripled is the ninefold muse. Now, these ninefold muses, these powerful goddesses that we see here, these great goddesses, they preside over all the arts on all the sciences. This is an image by Los Angeles artist Charles Sherman, who says, I draw what I like to look at. Okay, Joan, um, we know that the muse is just one aspect of the triple goddess. We know that she has many of her other faces, and I'd like you to tell us about some of her other faces. Who is this queen of the heaven and earth and underworld? <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Um, the triple goddess is really a kind of medial figure who stands between human women and the great energies and patterns of the universe. So that when a woman contemplates her, she goes transparent. The triple goddess becomes a transparent image, and a woman is able to see the identity between the rhythms of her own body and the great rhythms of the universe. So we really see the, the powers of the goddess embodied in a, in a female, then? Yes, very much so, because um, one of the ways that the triple goddess is spoken of and depicted is in the life cycle of a woman. The first aspect would be the maiden, the young woman, um, fresh new life. She's also called the virgin, but not in the sense that we use virgin today, meaning a sexually inexperienced woman. Virgin originally meant an autonomous woman, so she has that quality. The second aspect would be the mother, the matron, um, the upholder of society, the nourisher and giver of birth. And the third aspect would be the crone, um, the older woman, the witch, the healer, all of that. And these, again, relate to seasonal cycles. The, the, uh, the maiden or red goddess is the spring, the white goddess, the mother goddess is the summer and autumn, and the crone or black goddess is the winter. So all of these cycles reinforce and mirror each other. Now, why three? I mean, we know three is associated with the number of creativity, but why is it like the triple goddess? Yeah, it's, it, it seems to be that people looked around and saw threes a lot in nature. And since the goddess and nature really are the same thing, I guess they, they noticed it, as you said, um, the queen of heaven, earth, and the underworld. And there are lots of triplicities like that. I think also there's that sense that if you have two, it's you're kind of an either-or proposition. It's mm -hmm. one and then it's the other, like the, the yin-yang, which we're all familiar with. But the triple goddess having a third term says that it's never one and then the other. It's always a cycle back to the beginning again, so that it's not birth and death. It's birth, death, and regeneration, a movement back around to the beginning and a new start. Yes, and that definitely has a feeling of creation then, because you're not just going to one thing and another, but somehow that wheel transcends it and puts it into some whole other element of something new and something newly created. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at um, well, so how some of the artists have seen this triple goddess. So I know the first part we're going to be looking at um, the goddess in her tri triplicity and how she's seen with three faces. So let's look at our first piece of art. Okay. One of the really amazing things about, about goddess art is th how the same themes come up over and over again around the world and in all different periods. This is a rock painting from Spain, and this is from the prehistoric period, so it's very early. And there you have um, the th three women or three goddesses, and of course, again, it's always difficult to make the distinction between women and the goddess together. Now, how old is this, this piece? Well, it's prehistoric, and I don't have a, more of a date on it than that, so um, at least 5,000 years old. So again, we really see that as like an ancient archetype that has like captured the, the artist's imagination. And again, mm -hmm. as I said in the beginning, it's carried all the way through. I know that our next piece is contemporary. It's been painted in the past few years by Los Angeles artist um, Jean Edelstein. And again, 
uh, this next piece is three women dancing. We see, um, we see again, the women in a dance, as it seemed like in that first cave painting that we saw that it could be a dance. And Jean is an artist who lives in Los Angeles and shows at the Ruth Bachoffner Gallery. And this is um, a mixed media. And this is the sacred dance, which again shows the power of that image and that triplicity that it just carries uh, over all these years. It's amazing, amazing how similar those two images are. Yeah. And, and also we know that it isn't just in our Western culture, but we have pieces of art that are from other cultures, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a few examples from different cultures. Um, the next slide is from Japan, and it's from the Nara period, uh, which is about 700 um, CE. And this is Ashura. And you can see that although she has one body, she has three faces and six arms. So the six, three times two, huh? <laughs> yeah. always multiples of three. That is such a beautiful piece. And again, um, you know, we see it historic, prehistoric. We see it contemporary. And we see it in in um, in in the East. It's such a beautiful piece to see, like the three faces like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we also have another depiction of her from the East, too. Yes. Oh, what a, that's so glorious. This is one of my favorites. This is from Tibet, and um, ask me what her name is. What's her name, Joan? Her name is Maha Maya Vijaya Vahini. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say that. Um, th I love the energy and the, and the power of this piece. And again, she is, um, she's triple-headed, so three aspects in one. Now, is that the moon, that plate behind her, or what is it? Th the things on either side, I think that they're her moving arms. Really? I think so, yes. So they're re capturing her in, in s different moments of time, but all in a oneness. Yeah, and gr with great energy. Mm. Mm. Um, now, some of us have, we know the word Hecate, which is often associated with um, the, the triple goddess in her dark aspect. I mean, uh, if you read like over Metamorphosis, you know, there's like Hecate chants, Medea chants to Hecate and mm -hmm. her like the dark poisonous side of her. But we know that she's like a dark side. Yes, yeah, she is. She, um, she stands as the, the waning moon and um, the goddess of the underworld. And the next image that we have is of her, and she herself has become a triple. So while she is one of the three aspects of the triple goddess, she is further um, um, broken down into three parts. So here's triple-bodied Hecate. And one of the things that's always interesting to me about this slide is how very much she looks like the Statue of Liberty. Oh, yeah, now she's holding a torch there? She's holding a torch, and she has the same spiky crown on her head and the same draped robes. So it's actually like three bodies here. Now, that's a, a torch in each one, or is she holding a snake back there? Or? Yeah, they're very d various different things that the different arms have in them, which would be things related to, to Hecate. All right. Um, and again, we see this aspect of the, the triple goddess throughout all the history of art. I know that it isn't just related to quote-unquote um, prehistoric or pagan art, but that actually she continues very much as a strong theme in Western art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next image is by Michelangelo, The Three Fates, and this is another black goddess who has been um, broken down into three aspects. This is Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. And in Greek mythology, they are the ones who determine the, lo the length of uh, lifespan. And um, Clotho spins out a thread of one's life. Lachesis measures it. And Atropos, she who cannot be denied, cuts it. And that's one's death. And this image remains very potent even in the later art of, of Europe. Yes, and of course we see her um, in, in Shakespeare's plays, in Macbeth, with the three fates. And mm -hmm. I think it's known as the Eumenides there and how she presides over one's fate. In a certain way, they're sort of the flip side of the muse, aren't they? That sense of, um, you know, that last aspect of the, the destruction rather than the creation and the visitation of life. Very much so. And the humanities are an interesting figure as the flip side of the muses who inspire because they are the defenders of the matriarchal order and they punish those who, who offend against that, that order, which is why they went after Orestes in the famous Greek play. Um, so yes, he killed his mother. That's right. He <laughs> committed the ultimate matriarchal crime. Right. All right. Now let's look at uh, you know we've seen an overall aspect of the goddess in uh, a triplicity. Now let's just take a look at her in her first aspect as the red goddess, or as we think of her as the virgin. I thought that was very interesting what you were saying that the virgin being independent, mm -hmm. you know that sense rather than unspoiled or hasn't been touched by another man or something, but right. the sense of her is pure unto herself. And so let's let's take a look at her the the goddess in that face. Okay. 
The first slide is a kore, which means maiden in Greek. Mm -hmm. And um, here you can really see her as the embodiment of young life, of the springtime, of, of new beginnings, of freshness, the dew on the bud. Oh, she's so beautiful. Really. She really is. And then as she matures, she's born at the vernal equinox, the, the spring, the beginning of spring. And as she matures over the spring, then at uh, the summer solstice, she attains her, the full height of her physicality and really takes on all the things we think of as the red goddess. And in the next slide, you can see um, an Indian example of her joyous sexuality. In, um, Indian art seems particularly to capture this. This is a tree dryad, and you can see that sense of autonomy and freedom and joyousness in her body and its erotic abilities. So again, that sense of the virgin as, again, an independence and also strongly, um, the, the strongly owning their own bodies and, and the power and the vitality, and that's celebrated rather than looking at as a wantonness or something, but something yes. to really take joy in and the, the joy of life. Very much so, and um, there are many mythologies of goddesses who can renew their virginity annually by bathing in a certain stream. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, you can take out your option again every once a year, and it really doesn't have anything to do with, with um, the state of your body, but it's rather a, a psychic state. Hmm. Okay, now, um, we also know that, that uh, the goddess is in this youthful aspect is also Aphrodite. Mm -hmm. And we see her like, um, she's a, that actually means born of the foam, right, of the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have a, a, f a series of slides of Aphrodite which show her transformation from a very early powerful goddess to the kind of ultimate patriarchal goddess. So the first one in this series is an Aphrodite from Carthage. Okay. And in this image you can see a kind of raw power that's, that is missing in later images of Aphrodite with which we may be more familiar. And what she's doing is revealing her body mm. um, as a sacred act. This is, this is the ultimate spiritual revelation, is the body of the goddess. So she's drawing back the veil and allowing her worshipers to see that. And she, in fact, holds in her hand a mirror to reflect that, that sacred image. This is such a powerful piece. I mean, from it's so seductive, even like the slight sway of the hips and the power that she has there. And again, the celebration of the power of the female body and, and the life of the body. And, and um, also, it, it as a creative force, the, the feminine body and the sacredness of that creativity. It's, it's just such a healing image. The ultimate, the ultimate um, creativity and that sense, too, that the ultimate revelation is not of some spirit separate from the world, but is the very body of the world. Mm. Um, then what happens is that she is kind of reborn, uh, as the next slide shows. This is the famous uh, image of the birth of Aphrodite from the waves. As you mentioned, yeah. her name me means foam-born. And this, uh, this is a very beautiful and lovely image, and even echoes the triple goddess in its composition. Um, but she is also being prettified. She is being made more acceptable to the new patriarchal order. And as the end result of that in the next image, we see her as the famous Venus de Milo, um, where, aside from the fact that she's armless, which I think is psychologically very interesting, <laughs> yes. um, she's in this kind of awkward pose and her clothes are kind of half falling off. She has really lost, as beautiful as she may be, that early sense of power and autonomy that she once had. Yes, I mean, um, of course, I'm all for beauty. <laughs> I think on record I'm all for beauty, but th one does lose a sense of power there and the sense of just the awesome celebration of, of life. Now, how long is the, dis the, the time span between, say, that first powerful Aphrodite we saw and this Venus? Well, they're not necessarily chronologically very far apart. I really chose them for the feeling that mm -hmm. they conve conveyed and that the, Ro the first Aphrodite is actually of the Roman period, but I think it holds on to traditions that were much earlier. All right. Now, um, one of this, this idea of goddess as virgin, obviously one of the strongest images of that is Diana the Huntress, who always did maintain her virginity, even in the patriarchal order of um, the, the Greeks. And I, I think like one of the images we have really returns to that sense of power. Yes, this is Diana, who is called Artemis by the Greeks. And um, she is w one of the strongest uh, virgin archetypes. Um, she's a hunter. She is a, a lady of nature and the wild places. Um, she has a complete commitment to women, and, and women are her chosen companions. She is free and wild, instinctive, and very powerful. 
and again, that sense of, of the goddess as a warrior, which I know in our next image, the um, Nike of Samothrace, which is elegantly in the Louvre, one can go and see it there, that um, again, we have the sense of the, the goddess being evoked as a warrior and as a sense of victory to her. When war comes in, it's not a, a role that I would say the goddess chooses for herself, but um, later on as she adapts to changing circumstances, yes, she becomes the embodiment of martial victory. Okay, and then we also know her as the Amazon, too, which um, some say that uh, that image of the Amazon is when the, the priestesses were defending the temples from um, the patriarchal invaders in the, um, I guess it's the Neolithic Bronze Age. But we do have a sense of her as, as the Amazon in the warrior, too, and I know mm -hmm. our, our next piece shows that. Yeah, it, the Amazon is really the earthly embodiment of, of that um, warrior aspect of, of the Red Goddess. This is a, a tomb from Caria in Turkey where the Amazons were supposed to have lived. And decorating it, this sepulcher, is a, an image of the Amazons fighting the Greeks. So, it, And on top of it is a portrait of the woman whose tomb it is. And, and I would think that she must have been an extremely interesting person to have chosen <laughs> that decoration. Well, that, that's a good one to end on, the first aspect. It's a nice, powerful image of the first aspect of the Triple Goddess. Let's move on to the second aspect, which Robert Graves calls the White Goddess. Mm -hmm. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about her? She's the mother, the nurturer, the birth giver. She's also a matron in the sense of the upholder of the community, um, more in the British sense of matron, where heads of hospitals and, and um, institutions are called matrons. So she has that, that power and authority. And perhaps the most famous, um, in Euro-American culture anyway, of these mother goddesses is Demeter, the corn mother. And the first image that we have is of her. Mm. She is the earth itself who gives birth to all life and sustains it. And you can see that she's holding in her hand sh uh, sheaves of wheat and snakes. And one of the things about this is the dignity of the mother here, and the dignity, I mean, that it's, it's a mother, but it's in like the fullest creative sense of that term of, you know, the center that holds and, and that gives meaning, and it's just such a power that's a center of holding the community together. Very much so, and I think also in the individual that if the, if the red goddess is sort of what we do in the world, our activity, our energy, our physical self, and the black goddess, which we'll get to in a minute, is our interior world, yeah. what happens inside, the white goddess is really the center that holds those two together, the point of union in that same way. All right, now um, our next image we want to see is um, an image by Leonardo da Vinci, which again carries into Western art um, and shows again the power of, and the dignity of the mother. And uh, the, now I know the name of this is Juno. And, and again, we see like the strength and the muscle. She isn't uh, the, the armless, seductive Venus de Milo, but we really see a strength and a musculature here. Very much so, very much the matron. And um, it's Juno who was the, the queen of heaven. And in the same sense, in the next image, we have Isis, the great Egyptian goddess, and Queen Nefertari. And with the two of them together, you see that, that equivalence between the white goddess and the queen, who is the ultimate mother of the community. So that in the same way that Amazon reflects red goddess, queen reflects white goddess. Oh, well, this is really quite a lovely image, too, here. So this is Isis with the queen. Yes. And then another aspect of the white goddess, in addition to the sense of center or, or mother matron, is as the contemplative. I mentioned the point of union between inside and outside. Mm -hmm. And the next image we have is, is a really beautiful Tara, which is from, from East Java. And this to me is the most perfect embodiment of that centeredness, that still point at the middle that gives power to all the rest. Yes, it's very serene and yet very powerful. One has a real sense of strength here. Very much so. And uh, this, this, the mother goddess, the white goddess, is often shown seated. And mm. in the next series of images, we see her in her familiar role as the actual biological mother. And we notice that she's often seated on a throne. This is from Chatel Huyuk from the Neolithic, so it's about 8,000 years old. And she has this wonderful sense of volume. You know, she really yes. takes up space in the world and has great dignity and weight. She's seated on a, a leopard throne, and although you can't see it very well in the slide, she is giving birth, and there's a child emerging from between her thighs. Yes, there's such a sense of power and gravity 
there, and, and yet a stillness to it too, you know, that one really feels her there at the center. You know? Exactly, exactly. And then in the next image, um, it, and it's the same thing basically, the, the uh, mother god is giving birth to a god. And the thing I love about this is the sense of power that it conveys, the real warriorship almost of childbirth. Um, the great creative act that it is, and the powerful act that it is. Yes, one sees like the, the strength in her face that it is really like an act of, of um, great power to, to, to be doing this and, and really delivering new life. Yes. So then finally, the last image that we'll show of the white goddess is uh, the, um, our own white goddess of Western contemporary Western culture, which is Mary, the Virgin Mary. And um, she's shown here with the Christ child. This image of the goddess with a, um, a child is very old and appears all over the world. But um, this one is, is indeed Mary. And one of the things that's most interesting about it is that she's standing on the crescent moon, which connects her with many of the ancient goddesses. Yes, I know. It's interesting how even though that's sort of the pagan image, the quote unquote pagan image, the moon, yet it, can, you know, it does emerge. It shows how powerful that archetype is in, in artists' imagination because it does emerge and they just can't help themselves. <laughs> even though it's Mary and, and the, you know, the baby cries, still her power is resting on the moon. Yes. You know, that, that, and, and of course the triple goddess is the lunar goddess. That's right. That's right. All right, so now wherever there's creation, there's destruction, because we know that the goddess always embodies it all. She is like the universal forces. So I'd like to look into um, the crone or the black aspect or the goddess. Um, well, she's seen as the black aspect, but we know that, that even though it is a sense of destruction, there's always the promise of regeneration. I want to say something about colors a little bit, because okay. um, we have a very negative association with black, the color of darkness and evil and all of that. But originally, black was the color of fertility. Oh, that's and white, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and white was the color of death because it's the color of bone. So I just want to say that so that we don't get stuck in our own mm -hmm. preconceptions about colors and what they mean. So let's go to the, the images of the, of the black goddess, who is the, the one who stands at the gateway between life and death. And in the, in, in the same way that we saw the image of the, the white goddess with the newly born child, then the black goddess is, is she who takes the, the dead child back to herself. So the Pieta, this is an Etruscan Pieta, shows that as she gives life, so she takes the dead back into herself. Yes, this is, you know, really quite a powerful juxtaposition to the last images of the white goddess and showing, again, the power of the goddess in her different aspects, how we do see her as the giver of life and yet the take her back into life. And yet there is a, uh, there's a sternness to this, but a gentleness, too. There is a sense of the great embrace back into the mother. I think there's a, a great dignity in the sorrowing of this goddess. And then, because we're dealing with the goddess, let's go to the next image now. Yeah, okay. um, when we never stop at death. We always move from death immediately into regeneration. This is uh, from the Nootka tribe in, in Canada, and it shows uh, the great goddess, and within that, the soul experiencing regeneration, waiting for rebirth. So that, that figure in the abdomen there is the soul waiting to be reborn? Yes. Oh. And the goddess goes on the same cycles herself. The red goddess is born, she matures, she becomes the white goddess, the, the ripe, um, fully, fully grown goddess who then ages into the black goddess and the black goddess then gives birth to herself again as the red goddess of the new year. So there's always that cycle around. Yes, and seeing this piece of art here, you know, that again, uh, thinking of these, this as a quote-unquote primitive piece of art, whereas really it's such a sophisticated sense and a deeply spiritual and, and earthly sense of the world and how it is. And also we know that um, the, the black goddess is the new or the old moon, and we know that the moon disappears at, at the end of its cycle, and we don't, and, and it is a sense of it being lost, but somehow it, it turns on itself and it appears again, so that new moon is really the disappearance and, and the reemergence of the moon again, too. Exactly, at the same moment, and that's why she's eternal, because she's always renewing herself in the same way that the snake was believed to be eternal, because it, she shed her skin and, and grew again, yes. Then another aspect of the black goddess is, as you were mentioning, the really terrifying um, things that nature can do sometimes. You know, nature that just doesn't give a darn <laughs> about how you feel about it, but has her own um, things going on. And so the next image is of Kali, mm -hmm. the great Indian goddess. And she is that 
uh, ver that, that instinctive power of nature. She's in the center here. She's beheading herself and feeding two aspects of herself on her own blood. And then Jeez. Go ahead. Below <laughs> her. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a powerful image. And below her, she's dancing on the divine couple. And what she's saying is, you think that everything originates from the union of feminine and masculine, but actually, I am the source of all. And also what I like about this is, is a sense, sometimes from our human point of view, things seem destructive. But we know that, um, you know, that again, it is this promise of regeneration. Very much so. So then, the next image that we have is of Lilith. And she also has a kind of demon character, um, so, that, so that she's, again, that, <clears throat> that scary part of nature. And I show this for uh, two reasons. One is that you see her connection to the bird goddess, which we talked about last mm -hmm. time. She is the bird, the owl, which is a bird of night. And also that Lilith is a very, very old figure. This is actually Sumerian from about 4,000 years ago. So it even predates biblical tradition. Hmm. Now we also know that the Aztecs have an image of her too, again to show the universality of the triple goddess. We know that um, we'd like to see our next image, which is an Aztec Indian image of, of, of the black goddess. Yes, another part of the black goddess is she who makes intoxicants and she who makes medicine. <clears throat> and this is, here she is making an intoxicant. She's the inventor of pulque. Um, the cactus is behind her, and you can see she's holding up the cup with the kind of psychedelic fumes arising from it. So he <laughs> here she is, the giver of craziness and, and wild vision and ecstasy. And then in the next slide that we'll see, yeah. the Madonna of Montserrat, she's the healer. She's the giver of health, healing herbs, that kind of thing. The great healing Madonnas of Europe that people go on pilgrimages to are all black Madonnas, interestingly enough, so that, that her character as healer comes through even in, in contemporary times. Oh, well, that's fascinating. Thank you so much, Joan. I think that we've seen in our show today that uh, the goddess is and has been a very powerful archetype in, in art for artists and in art throughout history. We see her not only as the muse, as the source of, of creative inspiration, but as that very creative power herself, the power, the universal power of creativity. And in what Robert Graves calls a simple loving declaration, none greater in the universe than the triple goddess. <laughs> in